Hi and welcome to the Rock and Rebel Radio podcast with me, Andy Phillips. And this week we have a little sort of after show party uh, after the two hour radio show I did where I focused on the best progressive rock of 1970. And this is part of a, a short series, well, 10, um, which I'm doing covering every year of that fantastic decade. And to discuss the show, the music, the musicians and the times as well, I've got some very, very special guests, starting with guitarist extraordinaire, Mr. Chris Gill, who's just released his latest album, Petrichor, under the band Rain Name. Uh, so welcome to you, Chris. No, very good to have you, thank you. Um, next up, we've got uh, the, the man that Chris asked to provide the bass on the album, and that's the ex-Renaissance bass player and living legend, Mr. John Kent. Welcome, John. Hello, living legend. A little wave. Um, and lastly, but no means leastly, if that's even a word, is it word? Leastly, anyway. Um, I've asked Elliot Min, keyboardist with one of my favourite progressive rock bands at the moment, the Far Meadow, to come and join the madness. Welcome, Elliot. Thank you. This is the Rock and Rebel Radio Show. Welcome, 1970. Uh, the de- decade started in 1970, um, was when, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was that funny actually. Uh, I don't remember a great event. I remember starting work in 1970. I remember that was just about the time people started to talk about Yes and, and bands like that. I was already into King Crimson and Pink Floyd by then, and obviously Jimi Hendrix. Uh, so yeah, it. It started in 67 for me, the prog thing, with Pink Floyd. Uh, and then it ended for me around about 1978. And then yeah, after that, that about it, was, right. it turned into something else after that. Important, an important decade, though, yeah, definitely. Because the tracks we, 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 we started with was uh, a yes track. We started with Every Days um, yeah. of Time in a Word. Do you, do you remember that coming out? Because to be honest, a lot, I think for, for me and Elliot, we are probably maybe 10 years younger. No, I, was, um, I was eight in 1970. So, so yeah, he was, was eight. I was 10. Um, yeah, rub, rub it in, why don't you? Yeah, yeah I think <laughs> I'm rubbing it in, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think this, is, this, is, this is quite good because you guys, you know, John and, John and Chris, you guys would have, uh, like, have experienced the time because he was, you know, 20, 20s, you know, in your 20s and things like that. So you would have heard these albums coming out and you would have heard these musicians coming out and you were playing at the time as well. Whereas for me and Elliot, this is, we would have probably gone back. I mean, I, I listened to Every Days, for instance, you know, Time and the Word, the Yes album. Yeah. Um, that would have probably been about 75 or 76 by the time I'd heard that. I mean, um, I mean, it was much, but I mean, if, if you, if thinking of influence, not influences here, but thinking back. I to the Time and the Word today. Time, time, if you look at uh, the first Genesis album and then you look at the first Yes album, to me, those didn't do anything f- for me. But it, it, there's a marked change, certainly on Genesis, but the track with The Knife, for example, yeah. a classic. Yeah. You know, that, that's a Genesis track, yeah. whereas the original original album to me was, was you know, sort of influenced by Beatles, the Beatles sort of thing, but not, not particularly, didn't really have their style. Yeah. Similarly, yeah. Yes, I think the first album to me, you could hear bits of where it was going, but but to me it wasn't. People like Chris Squire didn't have his. He didn't have that stamp on on the music until until time. Yeah. I mean, the first time I heard Yes was they did a single. They did a version of Something's Coming from West Side Story. Oh, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that. that was, on Atlantic, and that's the first thing I heard, and I thought, yeah. Wow, I've got to get myself some of this. Yeah. Uh, and I did. I mean, I bought Time in the Word the day it came out. Right. Um. Uh, I was, I wasn't so much a fan of Chris at the time, although obviously, you know, I grew, I grew to become great friends with him, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, but I mean, it's unfortunate that no longer that's going to be the case, but, but I was so inspired by what they were doing. I was, I mean, Genesis, yes, and as, and as um, Chris says, King Crimson, you know, I mean, I think we knew, like Elliot says, I think we knew what was coming. But it was still in its embryonic stage, and it had to settle down a bit, you know. But yeah, it was great times. Great times. I mean, I, actually. I mean I, people say, you know, if, if you look at yes, to me, it is actually around. To, to me, that music is all around the bass. You know, that that, oh, yeah. that hated their style when when Chris Squire wasn't with them on some of the later 
you know, and so on, when they when they sort of split up and, and, and whatever, you could tell you could tell there was something missing. Yeah, I mean, I, I got asked to join them when they'd be doing Anderson, Ravian, uh, Anderson, Wakeman, Bruford, and Howe. Yeah. But it all went a bit pear shaped. So I got a phone call in the bath from their manager. I was in the bath and he said, Oh, yeah, I believe you can play all the yes stuff. I said, Yeah, <laughs> sure. But Bruford, logistics wise, they were in California and Bruford decided that he wanted to use Jeff Berlin. So I never got the gig. But yeah, it's all built around the base. And, you know, Chris has influenced so many people. I mean, yeah. that, it, once you start playing a Rickenbacker, everybody says, Oh, you sound like Chris Squire. Yeah. But that, of course, isn't the case, really. But yeah, I mean, I love yes, yeah. great band. Well, I noticed. I mean, I mean, I, I was sort of listening, just thinking about uh, Northern Knights, your uh, track that you're on. <laughs> but but I can hear some of those bass lines. It you can hear that's kind of the fact that you're playing fifth notes and third notes on in in uh, uh, as root, and it, it, that to me epitomizes that that sort of style, the style that maybe you know. Yeah, well, the thing with me with Renaissance was the fact that, okay, we didn't have an electric guitar, mm. which was wonderful because it meant I could stretch out a bit because I started yeah. off as a guitarist. Um, but with Renaissance, with it being so classically orientated, when I was playing bass, I was actually in my head playing a cello line mm. or playing a brass part or something like that. I never actually played a bass part in my life. It's always an interpretation of something else to me. Right. That's what's great about working with Chris because we both come from that left field kind of way. Yeah. Thank you. That, that makes sense now you've said that. Some of the bass that you've done, that makes perfect sense. Mm. I, can, I can hear that now. Particularly um, on some of the end, endings that you've done where you've done that whoop, 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 those bits. That's, that's almost like the cello, yeah. Oh, yeah, the old, the old volume pedal. <laughs> but I think also that uh, you, yourself, uh, Chris Squire, actually turned the bass into a lead instrument. Because up yeah, until I mean, that think Chris, point, Chris, Chris started, it was an instrument that was... It was sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, well, as I say, with me, I was very lucky that I had a lot of space because we didn't initially have an electric guitar. So I, I had a much broader palette when it came to playing bass. You could use much more of the fretboard uh, and make more, well, make, all I ever wanted to do was to be the best place play, bass player I could be. I wasn't worried about being famous or being in a popular band or whatever. It was just a case of, of taking what I had chosen as an instrument to see how far I could take it. I mean, I started off listening to Ray Brown, you know, an upright player. Oscar Peterson, you know, um, and then I like Jack Bruce and people like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just saw most people then until like people like Chris and humbly may I say myself came along. The bass was exactly what it said. It was a bass. It stood at the back, foot on the bar, off you go, try and lock in with the drummer. But then all of a sudden, you say you pushed it forward to a lead instrument, and the Ricky was probably the best instrument then to do that on. Yeah, I, I, th I think maybe maybe I'm uh, my, my problem is also when I when I play keyboards I get criticised for using the bass quite a lot and, and making you know putting putting bass lines almost on onto it and it really upsets the our bass player as you can imagine. But but I don't know. I think to me that's a lot of what stimulates the chords to me around. around. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's very difficult to play the keyboards in. I hate the term progressive, but we're using it, and here we are. Well, yeah, 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 you have to, you have to, you know, yeah, I, 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 it's, a, it's a problematic term, yeah, but, you yes, know, it's, it's like, a problematic term, you have to, yeah, you have to you have in the genre to, somewhere along the way, you know. I find it very difficult to play keyboards without putting the bass end in, yeah. to be honest with you, it must be like, you know, just get rid of this hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or just do chords and solos, that's the, uh... yeah, well, I don't know, that, 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 that's the thing with me. It's very much around chords. I, I love I love good I love beautiful chord sequences and, and mm -hmm. when you've got um when you haven't got that, you know, you you're restricted and not playing the bass. You've got to when you construct the chord, you've got to you've got to have that bass line in, in. Yeah, and of course I think for a keyboard player you are very much not governed, but it depends on the bassist that you've got with you as to what you can actually leave to the bassist. Yeah. You know, as to whether you've got to cover 
that bass end of the of the music of the audio spectrum, or whether you can just leave that in safe hands and get on with what you're doing best, which is seeing how many notes you can get in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Right. We were talking. We were talking about that um, uh, before. That, that uh, I don't know how, how you feel about bands like Dream Theater, uh, John. I mean, what, what, what's your what's your view on, on that? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know if you've heard um, people like Dream Theater. This kind of what they call progressive progressive yes, metal. I have. I have. Yeah. Um, the jury's still out on that one. I haven't listened to a lot. Mm -hmm. but, I find it very soul. I was we were playing. I find it quite soulless. Although, you know, the Jordan Rudess, what an amazing keyboard player. What well, the whole band, they're just amazing musicians. But they, yeah. it just doesn't. There's no soul to it. It's all sort of very technical. And, and well, yeah, that's that's the that's the trouble, isn't it? As I say, I mean, that was you know, what I said about progressive in its it's in its earlier days. It did become a sort of a a show off platform for a lot of people. Look at what I can do. See how many notes I can play. You know, yeah. I mean, and then you go to people that take it really, really seriously, and they are incredibly technical. But it is there for a reason. We toured in the states a lot with Return to Forever. Oh so, right, you know, oh, wow. Stanley Clark, Chick Corea, Al Jamil, yeah. and then yeah. anyway, I mean, I never missed a gig of theirs. Whether we went, we did a situation across the whole of the country where if they were more popular, they would headline. We were more popular. We would headline, and those guys are just phenomenal. Now, yeah. if they pl if they play like you know, Hemi Semi Demi Quavers, you know, all night, and that's great because that's what that music needs. Yeah. But they weren't trying to show off. No, no. Yeah, you know, the weird thing is that bands like A Return to Forever, um, Mahavishnu Orchestra, all those sort of things. You know, I mean, I, I love all that stuff, and I do put that in the show. I mean, I. I I do have a, a sort of a love for that side of it, you know, the um, uh, the more jazzy side. Uh, but that isn't that isn't the same as what you're saying about Dream Theater. I mean, I, I'm I'm sort of pretty much in the same camp as you, Elliot, with Dream Theater and bands like that. I, th I, th I think they've got some great albums. They've done some great music. But sometimes you listen to it, and it just it just feels like it's just technical for the sake of technical. Yeah. yeah. And, and the yeah. melody goes out the window, and yeah. um, yeah, you know, when when you're doing something where Oh, let's put a bar of eleven in and a bar of thirteen in, and just and then just and then and, and you know just just because you can. It, yeah. That's it. If it doesn't need it, you know, why do it? I think the, I think the other thing is. I'm just saying, I think the other thing with bands like that is if you if you if you let's say one of the guys from Dream Theater left and they picked up the phone now and asked me to go and play with Dream Theater. Yeah. If they turn around to me and said, "Right, Chris, make it your own," how on earth would you do that? Because yeah. it's already so set in stone the way that it goes. Absolutely. If I tried to do anything different to vary from that path in any way at all, it would all completely fall apart like a house of cards. That's so right. it's set up, it's built up, and you can't change it. So when you go to play it live, it has to be exactly the same because if you don't do it, it just falls apart. Absolutely. There's no room to move. It's, it's, no room to, you know, to, to, quote, to quote King Crimson, it's discipline, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah. The whole thing is discipline. So the fun element really goes out of it yeah because you know yeah. what you can play in advance all the time yeah i mean did, yeah. did you ever did you ever play john did you ever play with sort of um frank zappa or uh, did you were you ever around or no um i went to see him but mm. i never managed to be lucky enough to um to, to, to share a stage with him but i mean that guy like we had a drummer with with us for the last three years i was in renaissance uh, Gavin Harrison, who's now with Crimson. Fantastic drummer. Yeah. Possibly the best drummer in the world. Yeah. And I say it not because he's a friend, but because he is. Yeah. But he used to, on the tour bus, he used to buy the, the, the music books for Zappa. And on Joe's Garage, if you know the Joe's Garage album, yeah. you start reading through it and there's a guitar part. And it's got eight bars of nothing written. And it says, imply cow. What? No. <laughs> In <laughs> uh, I, I kid you not, eight bars of nothing imply cow written in big letters in the middle. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> right, right. Which, which Adrian Blue would have done fantastically, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
how do you employ a cow? I mean, where would you where would you even start with that? <laughs> well, you probably turn up really loud, and get your whammy bar, and go. No, but I mean, you're talking about you're talking about discipline. I remember. I think this is a bit later than 1970, but um, there was a uh, the one size fits all album that uh, that track Inca Roads, and you listen to it on the album, you think, crikey, you know, they must have must have really, uh, you know, there's no way they could play this live. And then you hear the live album, and it's played exactly as on on, on the record, and you think, oh, well, yeah. how, how. I mean, the, the guy is, you know, was really out there. I mean, you must have heard the Eddie Jobson stuff story when he wanted Eddie to play keyboards with him. He phoned him up in his hotel room, played something, I don't know, bizarre down the phone to him and he said have you got a keyboard in the room he says i always have a keyboard and he said well play it back to me and he, he played something that was like ridiculous and eddie sort of like struggled and sort of was it we'll play again and he played it back he said yeah okay you're okay you, you got the gig <laughs> well I, I i actually talking about eddie jobson he's probably to me i may not sound like that but he's one of my biggest influences i, I think you know i uh, love him but UK to me, um, it's just such a shame that they they only did a couple of albums. In fact, my yeah. album, yeah, yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I still play it now. Yeah. Anyway, I went, yeah, I went to see UK in 1978. Um, did you? It was uh, Holsworth, Bruford, Wetton, and Andre Jobson. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was that uh, they, they they played in this. I was living in Texas at the time. I went to see them at Rice University in Houston. Right. And I had the T-shirt and everything, and and everything that they did on that album, including John Wayne's woo that he did on the bass and one another, he did that perfectly live every time. Yeah. And yeah. that's still to this day one of the best gigs I've ever been to. And I was only sitting about twenty feet away from Alan Holdsworth, watching him really closely what he was doing. And I still have no idea how he did what he did. No idea whatsoever how he did that. Such, a, such an incredible guitarist, though. Yeah. Just an incredible guitarist. Yeah. Amazing. And yeah. As well. I mean, just... And it's, don't it, like it's, saying there, it's, it's your guitar playing. playing but, I, you know, you just never hear that sort of stuff, you know. You just never hear that sort of stuff. It was... No. It's we iconic. Did, we did a couple of concerts with Mahavishnu. I just stood there and watched my cloth in and thinking, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> And he made it look so damn easy. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it was the, it was the uh, you know when he was in his sort of um, mantra mode. And yeah, just the white put, flowing put the white stuff, gear you know. on, and he just stood there and he just flowed from. Is that wow. the time when he used to use a double neck? You know the the yeah the, the, the gear gear string, string, yeah. string. Yeah. Absolutely, Absolutely incredible. I mean, all those sort of guitars. That is, uh, that's why I, I love it, you know, and. and I mean, Elliot, we were talking uh, about holes with the other day about um, uh, it bites and things like that. You know, oh. must have must have been must have been influenced by. An yeah, album. I mean, well, yeah, uh, what's name? Francis Dunnery. Yeah, mean, Francis yeah, Dunnery. You, know, you listen to some, but it's not the same. You know, you, when you hear Holdsworth, he, I don't know, some of those chords. Apparently, the the story goes. You you, you guys would probably know better than me, but the story goes that between Dave Stewart, you know, when they were in the Bruford band. Between Dave Stewart and Holdsworth, they would. Uh, I think they used to compete with who could find the most um, most w obscure chords to to play. Because <laughs> they, just, you know, you listen to them. How? Where does that chord? What is that chord? <laughs> yeah, I know. Amazing. It's uh, another band that we uh, we had on the uh, on the show on the seventy show was um, uh, Van de Graaff Generator. Oh, yeah. Peter Hamill. Yeah, so Van de Graaff Generator, um, big favourite of mine, which is why I keep on putting them on the show because I bloody love them. Um, and uh, Chris, you, you, um, you, you typed something in yesterday about uh, Van de Graaff Generator, getting you back into it. Is that was that you or was it you, John? I can't remember. It wasn't. Yeah, you. it was me. Yeah, it was. Um, I, went, yeah. I, I went to see them. Uh, but I think I saw them in 1970, 71, 72, and seventy three. I think and. Um, it was a Friars, John, you know Friars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I went to see it now. And um unbelievable. I mean I mean David Jackson is the only guy I've ever seen who plays a couple of saxophones at the same time. You know. Yeah. Just amazing. Peter Hamill sings with his head to one side like this. 
all the time, but but somehow it gets the note out, you know. And um, yeah. I think I told you last time I had a conversation, Andy, I, I was on the Dodgems with him in Western Supermare on the pier. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, because they, they were doing the Winter Gardens there. And I went there to see the gig, and I was killing some time, and so were they. And we all met on the pier at the same time. We had to go on the Dodgems. And um, <laughs> that, that was amazing. But David Jackson is still doing stuff now, but he's also got this uh, gadget that he's made that autistic kids can put their hands in and make music. Oh, you know, oh. Oh. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah, it was on one of those things where they, not, not it wasn't on Click. It was one of those shows where they have new gadgets on us. Well, that is brilliant, that is. Yeah, it was really good. And it, it's almost like different colored lights. And depending on which light you put your hand in, it makes a note. So it's autistic. Right. Right. And they're I think I've seen that. Did, did uh, Jean-Michel Jarre use that on stage? I'm sure I've seen oh, yeah. him do, like, oh, you know, his hands in line. Yeah, I didn't know he was autistic, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. But yeah, it, it might it might have done, yeah, because I, I mean nobody's got more lights than John Shells are, have they really? Yeah. But um, no. but no, I just, I just remember seeing seeing that. Oh, and, he did and... have this massive sort of fake keyboard that went all the way around him in the set, like a rainbow, and yeah. it all got different mm. colour flashing lights on it and things. It was a bit like painting by numbers, but the keyboard played. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I suppose I, when you're on, when you're on your own, you get to amuse yourself somehow. Absolutely. I saw yeah. Dave Jackson playing with um, the Dave Cross band. Well, I went to a, uh, it was the Cambridge Rock Festival, I think, and he mm -hmm. was um, he was there playing. And that, that, they were really good because obviously it was a, they, they did a lot of King Crimson numbers. So they did um, they did uh, uh, Red and they did uh, uh, Starless, I think. And, and oh, people. I love Red. I love Red. It's so evil. Crimson album again. I know it's later, but uh, to me that was a that was a really great album. Even though there were only the three of them. Let's say that was just that was Wet Wet and Frip and Bruford, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. Wet did all the vocals on that as well, didn't he? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's a good album. Yeah. UK, I, I was privileged to see UK um, just. Before Wet and Died, actually, um, and it was um, at the Chelsea Under the Bridge. Uh, uh, Chelsea. Oh, I know. Yeah, and well, then, John, uh, John played the Renaissance for a while, you know, for about six months. Did he? Yeah, in the very he early days. He did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I went, I went to John's funeral. Was that before you or after you, John? That was just before me. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, he's played with. Obviously, it was Uriah Heap, wasn't he, before that? And then, That's right, uh, yeah. So, like, all these, all these amazing players that, like, turned up in bands you wouldn't expect them to. <laughs> you know, and then he goes from King Crimson to Asia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was time I made a lot of money. I I went, yeah. to, I went to see uh, Bill Bruford uh, with Earthworks. Um, oh, yeah. I, some, it was several years ago, obviously, because he's retired. But I asked him at the time, I said, are, are you going to go? And I think it must have been, yeah, I, I can't remember what, what year it was. But I said, are you um, are you ever going to do some more Crimson? Are you ever going to go back and, you know, reform or, or whatever with a, with, a, with that that sort of um, uh, lineup? He said, uh, oh, he said, it's so, so 20, he said, so 21st century. He <laughs> said... <laughs> <laughs> no, he's quite he's apparently, apparently according to Gavin, I was speaking to him the other day, Gavin Harrison. Apparently, you know, I said, you know, what's it like working with Robert? It's just an absolute nightmare. <laughs> he says, because he'll just look at you and say, Well, in this section, just play what you think should be in there. Doesn't give you any clue at all. <laughs> just do what you think's right. And then of course you do it, and he says, "Well, that's not a what. That's not what I want." <laughs> no, I could I could imagine him being quite an exacting, uh, an exacting person. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I've seen the ways, uh, you know, on stage where um, I think someone was taking photos. He doesn't like the limelight, does he? Or he doesn't yeah. like the limelight. And there was someone taking photos, and they stopped the whole gig. And um, and uh, he said, you know, until. I get that camera from the film. We're not playing. 
which yeah. is I know. So, oh, prima donna. Mm. It's a bit, it's a bit sort of mad because that's what you expect people to do is to take some sort of memory away with it, you know. And that's what I just find for. it, I, I find it really hard to play for someone like because if it, and I've seen him live a couple of times with various in, incarnations. In fact, I saw him playing with Adrian Ballou, and Adrian Ballou was playing the drums. He was really good on drums too. Really, and uh, but he's got this intense stare. He's watching the whole. Everybody's playing with. He's like he doesn't take his eyes off them hardly, hardly ever. No. And I find that really a bit unnerving, actually. Mm. It's a bit intimidating, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would find that a bit strange, yeah. Because yeah. if you watch him, he just watches him. Yeah. But I can imagine playing with Zappa was, was, was equally... Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you get anything wrong there. And <laughs> sort of... I mean, you know what kind of guy you're up against with Zappa? I mean, it, it, he played Pennsylvania University and just for a laugh put some LSD in the water coolers. <laughs> you will enjoy this yeah. one. Oh, well, that, is not good. <laughs> that is not good. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I, I saw an interview with Eddie Jobson. He was saying when he played with Zappa, there was something about, um, he said, you know, he was only a, a kid. He said he grew up more in that in those few years or whatever or the year that he was playing with Zappa or than he than he had in his whole life. <laughs> so he saw some things that he'd never seen before. <laughs> yeah, that, that that I can imagine. Yeah. On this on the on the thing about Van der Graaf though, Van der Graaf generator, Elliot. I know that when we spoke, you said that you know. Yeah. They're not the sort of band that that is you know um, you know pricked your interest too much. No. You know. No, I mean, am I, I, am I beginning to change your mind a little bit? You, you are actually. I, I mean, I that track, um, kill, uh, was it Killer? Was yeah, Killer, yeah. That, that, um, that, that I, I, I sort of remember that, yeah, I, I obviously lodged in my, in my, in my brain somewhere. But that is actually, I can see, I can, it's starting to grow on me, I think, uh, is what I would say. I've but it was never, they, were, they were never a band, I, I think, that, to, so. I, I think another thing with Van de Graaff is that, um, they're one of those bands that, if you listen to their albums, they're really, really good. But they really are. But you need to see them live to really get right. the vibe. Agreed. Because the albums, yeah. are, the, the albums are all neat and tidy, everything swept up and cleaned up and polished yeah. and all made beautiful. When you see them live, and the, the bass player is not controlled by anybody, uh, the sound volumes aren't controlled and, and EQ and all the rest of it, it's a completely different ball game. Okay. And... Um, and, and the, the sound that they make, it, it just hits you like a bus. Whereas listening yeah. to an album on, on, on headphones, that ain't going to happen. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of bands are like that. You listen to them on record, they're, they're too clean, too yeah. neat and tidy. You go, yeah. And so you don't really appreciate what they're trying to do. Um, but you go and see them live and just bam, it's straight in your face. Of, Whoa, what's going on here? It's, it's just amazing. It's just a, just a yeah, wave that hits you. It happens with a lot of bands, don't you think? that? I mean, okay, you do your albums and all the rest of it. I always thought that with with, with Renaissance, our albums were, were were good. Don't get me wrong, um, not all of them, but I mean, most of them were good. But we were so much better live than we ever were recorded. And that, and that, I think, I think that's the the, the, the message. I, I actually used to get quite upset with um, when you saw Genesis live. They're, they're very formulaic. I mean, they, they, you know, Banks doesn't improvise much at all no. um and yet you see someone like yes or yourselves and and, and there's, there's that kind of improvisation and that to me is what why would you go and see a band live if all they're going to do is play what's on the record you know yeah yeah i think genesis were more sort of um uh gritty i think in the early days you know there was a an element of playing around a little bit because they used to they used to expand tracks and things like that uh, but i think when they got to sort of 70 probably lamb lies downtime it was like this is how it's got to be and and i think banks is like that though it's it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's very tight it's got to be this way you know um i mean it's, it's all completely controlled in terms of that this is this is how it's going to go this is the, you know the progressions are, are such that you can't there's no room to kind of go out and do some sort of improvisation. Yeah, Genesis aren't an improvisational band at all. Um, yeah, yes. I, I love them and they're one of my favourites, but yeah. they're, they're absolutely not. Yeah. 